Here we are, another week, another Bengals game, another 3 a.m., Coney. I am here with Lucas. We are going to talk about the Bengals. We're going to talk about the Reds, who are looking great. Bring back the win the whole damn thing segment because it looks like Welcome back. they could potentially. Hey, man, I turned the game on because you know how I've been doing it? I've been doing the uh, you know box score, every highlight, watch it, but – they started on this four or five game win streak when I didn't have it on the TV. So I'd really just been kind of shying away from it. You know, Cincinnati sports fans, you just are like, man, maybe it was my fault this whole time that this was a bad baseball team. And last night I finally said, you know what? I'm going to have to watch them if they make the playoffs. So they better start showing up tonight. And that Brewers game, boy, they won. They won. They're back. I'm proud of them. It's so exciting. We had to talk about them again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ever since you tried to put them in timeout, well, we did put them in timeout, and we didn't talk about them at all, but then you were like, if they win both games today of this double header, I guess we'll have to talk about them on the show. And I was like, they're going to, and we're going to, and they're going to sneak on in, and they won those, <laughs> and they have been going on a tear ever since. Well, I mean, let's go ahead and just – I know we put the rundown as Bengals first, but we're here. We might as well just do the Reds. Let's do it off the coney because the 60 game season and you know i just i'm, I'm gonna sound really I, I think this is good growth from me though because i i really think the 60 game season got me got everybody and we way 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 overreacted about the team and about the panic levels and about all those things now i think had it been 162 game season the start they would have had we would have had calmer heads and said, okay, they are not ready yet. They're, they've got to glue together. Some things have to go right. They're having some bad luck, but give them time. And right before we were about to bail on the team, they would have had a winning streak like this. Yeah. So imagine a real season where you'd be feeling about this team. You'd be like, okay, they're going to be competitive for the playoffs moving down, the regular playoffs, not the expanded postseason. Maybe they can catch the Cubs in the division. If they slow down, this might be a pretty good team. We let the 60-game season get us way out of our groove in terms of judging a baseball team. Because I said that they were going to have a five- or six-game winning streak, and here it is, and it's put them in the expanded playoff. And you never know what can happen at this point. I still think this is a really talented team. It's a scary team. And David Bell somehow got it back on the tracks-ish enough. I still don't know if I believe in him. We'll see how the postseason plays out. But it's just a lot more positive. And I think we would have been way more positive about this team had we had 162. But the 60-game season put pressure on everybody, including those watching the team and hoping for their success. Oh, yeah, and then you had, the, what, two weeks left, and we were we were completely, you know what, David Bell was talking about in his post-game interviews, he's like, we're just going to keep playing Reds baseball, where we got some momentum, it just didn't go our way, and the fans are looking at that and going, well, when are you, when, what are you waiting for? When, when are you going to get it together? We, we got two weeks left, buddy, but now they are going on a tear. All of these winning streaks, they are, I think, nine wins in their last 11 games, three straight series wins after tying or losing the previous, like, 10. I don't know what the stats are on that. But 538 has the Reds at an 82% chance now of making the playoffs. And even last last night, there you go, even last night, um, scoreboard watching, a lot went the Reds' way. They won, and a lot of other teams that needed to lose lost. And so it is going to be a tough, tough, tough on the fans for this next five games where we are just clenched and trying to make sure, hey, get in, sneak on in, and then don't destroy all of our hopes and dreams. Well, I mean, how about this? What's worse, they blow it before they get there or they absolutely blow it once they're there? I mean, I would say get in. I would say you, you got to get in. Anything can happen at that point. I mean, listen, 
heartbreak <laughs> playoff losses, I'm not sure I'm ready to handle one in 2020. It's been a rough year. And, and I thought for a minute that the Reds would be really good and they would win a playoff series. I, I, I've, obviously, I want them to get in because I think that with our rotation, with our top three guys, Matt, it doesn't really matter who we play. We can beat anybody in a three-game series. And that's really the interesting thing about the three-game series is it's almost like March Madness for baseball. Anything can happen. The number one goal for the Reds right now should be because you didn't show urgency at the beginning of the year, because you didn't have this urge to win games, you're now in a position where the momentum's coming your way, but you're running out of games. You need to get out of the way of the Los Angeles Dodgers. That seven seed is so much better than the eight seed because the eight seed, you open with the Dodgers, which automatically makes it a harder road. If yeah. you're the seven seed, you open with the Cubs, Cubs. And possibly the Braves or a really beatable team in the next round, and then probably the Dodgers, but maybe the Dodgers get upset. So right now, if you're a Reds fan, it's not even about getting in the postseason. It would be a major, major disappointment if they didn't get in at this point now that it's at 80%. Right now it's about seeding, positioning. Where can the Reds get? I'm looking at that seven seed is perfect for us. Yeah. Slot into the seven seed. You get to play a division rival in a three-game series at a neutral site. I, I think that would be a lot of fun. It'd be a blast, and I'd love to see Reds-Cubs in the opening round, and I think that's the best matchup for Cincinnati. Hashtag take the seven. All right, let's go to Bengals now. We got – we had a, a close, close game. Five points on the scoreboard. Uh, do you think it was as close as it really was? Yeah, actually, I mean, that game was close. And the only reason was – it was one of these games, and everybody's refusing to see this right now because it is a rookie quarterback, but that looked like a game where there's a great quarterback on a bad team versus an all right quarterback on a great team. Yep. And that's the only reason it's close is because the quarterback play has such a wide gap. Listen, Browns fans, if you watch that Thursday night game and you come away thinking you have the better guy, I really I, – I can't – I don't have – I really don't have hope for you because you're going against a bottom five defense. Okay. And he's rolling out play action, one read, making sharp throws. He starts 12 to 13 because the defense has nine in the box ready to stop the run. And you're pulling out play action because of this two headed monster. And then your run game gets rolling. Odell Beckham beats William Jackson on a double move, a great double move, and you toss one in. I mean, it was just an okay performance for Baker Mayfield. It's what the Browns needed. He can be – like, Baker Mayfield, you know who he reminded me of last night? Mm. Andy Dalton. He really did. <laughs> right? You know, a B-minus arm. Baker's a little more accurate, and I think Baker has a little bit more pizzazz and juice to him, but Baker doesn't handle pressure as well. That's yeah. the – we did not touch Baker Mayfield until the second half. Remember, we didn't touch Baker Mayfield, I think, until he threw the interception. And you get the 15-yard penalty after because of the necessary roughness. And I'm watching the game. i got to hit this guy. We're not hitting him at all. I'm watching the game, and I was like, okay, a coach needs to look at somebody and go, okay, someone's got to eat a 15-yarder here because we cannot let – Baker Mayfield is clearly a player that is not designed to handle pressure well. Mm -hmm. Every time – he gets pressured every time he takes hits. He gets worse in the NFL. It's happened every time. He gets shoddy in the pocket. His feet get choppy. He rolls out too quickly. He makes bad reads, and he makes bad decisions. But the number one thing you have to do to get Baker Mayfield in that mode is pressure him. You have to hit him. You have to contact him. And the Bengals didn't do it at all. And you know, the D-line, I think Carl Lawson said, well, all the writers and reporters, they think it's just the D-line that it doesn't get pressure on the quarterback. But it's hard to get pressure on the quarterback when you can't stop the run. And I agree with that to a point. But there were third and longs. There were situations in which you just have to go and get the quarterback. And it's not that he had some time and he was getting rid of it quick. It's that he had all damn day, Matt. I mean, he had much time as he wanted to throw the ball hours to throw the ball the Browns offensive line looked like a brick wall to all the Bengals defenders and you still have Dunlap and you have Lawson and you have Hubbard 
And I can't say that it's just because they couldn't stop the run because last week in the first half, when you did good against the run, you couldn't get any pressure on Tyrod Taylor either. So this is one of those things that I did not see coming from the Bengals, Matt, having the defensive line be unable to get any pressure on the quarterback whatsoever. And that is a real worry for me against really good quarterbacks that are coming up throughout the rest of the schedule. If you don't pressure Ben Roethlisberger, good luck. Yeah. <laughs> up if you don't pressure Lamar Jackson we were already not going to stop him but now no pass rush good luck we're going to give up 40 38 40 every time there's a competent quarterback or running game and that's really what bothered me is the inability to get pressure on Baker Mayfield yeah and that could have been one of the main deciding factors in the game that that we weren't even looking for I mean we knew that the offensive line was going to struggle defense yeah. actually looked great on that fourth, the fourth down goal line stand at the inch yard line, stop them and then immediately give it back in the exact same spot. Just Bobby Hart, or it was Fred Fred John, allowing them to just go and strip Burrow to get it right in the same spot so they could punch it in. That could have been the deciding factor in the game. There, we had a momentum shift, and we immediately gave it back to him, gave him seven points. And since you brought up Andy Dalton, him coming in to the Cowboys game, giving up. them the win. I mean, that was amazing. What a no. <laughs> Listen, I was because I was watching the game, and and Dak goes hurt, and I'm like, oh yes, I'm watching for it. Let's go, Dalton time, baby, Dalton time. Come on, bring him on, you know. And I, I would just love if he were the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys, but so would I. Comes on more excited than I've ever seen any backup come onto the field. I mean, he's like looking at everybody. He's like, "You guys are ready? Yeah, let's go." Let's go. He he goes for the PA rollout. I mean, he looks so like sped up and fast and adrenaline filled, and he's just like, "Oh," and he throws he tries to yeah. play, like he throws it straight out. <laughs> he makes the right decision, right? Yeah, yeah. For probably a second too long, but you know, made the right decision. And then they thought they scored, but then it wasn't on the review and Dak came in. But I've never seen a quarterback tap so many guys' helmets in a two-minute period. I mean, he was really just like, we're fine. I got this. I'm the – like, I'll, I mean, I'll, guys, I'm good. Like, he, I, he was ready. He, he was out there even before that. Just like, you know, offense coming off the play. He's, he's out there just high five, everybody. Then he had his helmet on and Dak got hurt. He just ran out there immediately. <laughs> ready to go. Let's go. Oh, I love it. I love Andy Dalton. Andy's got to be thinking somewhere in the back of his head. He's like, man, I was a three-time Pro Bowler. I went into an awful situation. And I went to the playoffs five straight years. And if I were in a great organization, I would be a great quarterback. He's got to be thinking that somewhere in his head. And maybe he thinks it's Dallas with all that talent and the money they spend. And he says, Dak's on his franchise tag. I come pretty cheap. If I come in and do great, maybe it's me, not Dak. Right? And so – I, I get why he was excited for the opportunity to try to help the Cowboys win the game. And I, I think he inspired them to an amazing comeback victory, 40 to 39 and, and much credit to Andy Dalton, but also watch all the credit to Andy, 100% of the credit to Andy Dalton, but watching him in hindsight, because like you watch Burrow in college, you watch Andy in the NFL and my eyes said, okay, Burrow's a better football player, but you'd never know. You never know because it's, it's not easily transferable, the speed of the game, the yeah. size of the NFL. It just looks different. But, I mean, I've seen them. It's, it's not even a contest now, Bengals fans. And, and Bengals fans, I need you to understand what happened, right? And Colin Coward said this on his show. A couple other, Mike Florio said something like this. All the national guys, they're barometers at 10. <laughs> but I need you to understand, Bengals fans. 37 of 61 for three touchdowns with no deep threat on a defense playing cover two shell. He ran no huddle most of the time. Three out of his four two-minute drill drives have ended up in a position to score. One of them got all the way to the 40 before it stalled. This is uncommon. Honestly, I know he's a rookie. It's his first two games, but that's the best two games I've seen a Bengals quarterback play in terms of quarterback play. Now, yeah. have there been better stats in two games? Without a doubt. Remember Andy Dalton's five touchdowns against the Jets? Remember Carson Palmer's beat down to the Bears? 
there's a lot of two-game stretches of amazing stats and wins. But in terms of how well the quarterback played, despite all the crap around him, it's the best two games I've seen a Bengals quarterback since I've been watching Bengals football, which is 2004. So I think the Bengals fans, we all need to sit here and realize that that's exactly what's happened. We have the guy. We have the guy. And before the season, Matt, I said, this team will go 11-5 and five if these things happen. Ready? Yep. Turnover luck. Turnover luck. None of that. We've lost the turnover battle in both of the first two games. Some of that because of the offensive line. One of that's a dumb throw from Joe. But you're not winning the turnover luck. The defense has only taken the ball away one time. And on an awful decision by Maker Mayfield and an accidental coverage by William Jackson. I mean, William Jackson was accidentally covering the man on the play. We needed the Steelers and the Browns to suck. They're both going to be at least 500 in my eyes after watching the Browns running game the other night. Jonah Williams, borderline pro bowler. We'll see about that. I doubt it, but maybe. A surprise in the linebacker room. I think they've all been generally decent surprises, but I meant like a surprise, man. Like a real good player. That's not happening. A.J. Green stays healthy. Um, yeah, but he's not A.J. Green anymore. So – We'll, we'll, we'll just have to do it. Yeah. He's like Larry Fitzgerald now. Great player, going to make catch it, but he's not a deep threat anymore. He's not the same A.J. Green. And the only one of these things I said that needed to happen for the Bengals to go 11-5 and five, that actually is happening is Burrow is the best rookie since Andrew Luck. That's it. That's the only thing that's happened. Nothing yeah. else has gone right. Nothing else has gone the best-case scenario for the Bengals. In fact, quite a bit of it has gone to the worst-case scenario for the Cincinnati Bengals. And it absolutely astonishes me that Joe Burrow has played this well in the opening two games, has impressed this many people, and we are 0-2. That honestly kind of terrifies me because this team is a lot farther behind, a lot farther behind in a lot of areas than we were hoping for. We knew it was possible, but they are behind in so many areas, Matt. I mean, there's just a lot of big, oh, no, moments with this team. And that's not what we wanted to see if we wanted to be competitive for a playoff spot. Yeah. And it is it is exactly what we thought it was going to be in terms of Joe Burrow. We thought that the Bengals were going to win these first two games, and they were in it. They were close. Uh, just a little bit more needed to go their way in order to turn these from, from loss to wins. But then you had the Chiefs that were struggling against the, the Chargers. So we are like, oh, the Chargers suck. Well, now they look like a pretty good team comparative to what they did to the Chiefs. And looking at the stats here, passing stats, after the first two weeks, Joe Burrow is number one with 97 attempts, number two with 60 completions, second only to Matt Ryan. Dak Prescott is right under there with 59 for 86. And Joe Burrow just broke a record in week two for the most completions by a rookie in his rookie season. Yeah, and you had LeBron, you had Colin again, you had, you had all these people on Twitter just going in and saying, this is the real deal. Joe Burrow has got it. Yeah. And when, when the Bengals can figure out how to get the rest of the team up to Joe Burrow's level, it's going to be a scary team. See, but this is, this is exactly the guy I want to handle this, okay? Because there's a couple things I heard. One, uh, Paul Dater from The Athletic. He does an amazing job. I love a lot of his articles. And he, he – brought up the proper question, which it's okay to ask, is this going to mentally and physically ruin Joe Burrow? He, said, he wrote the article, this is the perfect recipe to ruin a rookie quarterback. I will go right along hand with Paul and say that if we let Joe Burrow get whopped as much as he's getting, I mean, it's not going to be the good type of whop. It's going to be the injury type of whop for Joe Burrow. I mean, that's physically, yes, I can't make an argument unless the kid is a weird physical specimen that doesn't get hurt, but I doubt it. I think the kid is capable of being hurt. He was hurt for a year at Ohio state. So that does worry me. The physical aspect, the mental aspect, he's going to need to go. zero and 16 or something, right? This would have to be 
the most drug. What about two and 14? Two and 14, probably. Maybe that drains them. But I just don't think it's in the kid's DNA. And I think that God bless Peyton Manning, everybody. God bless, God bless Peyton Manning because he talked about he had a three-hour conversation with Joe. And Peyton Manning went 3-13 and 13 his rookie year. And I guarantee that conversation from Peyton was this. You're going to lose. You're going to lose. But here's what you can't do. You can't adjust to. You can't say it's okay. You can't say we'll get them next year. You can't say we're not ready. You can't say patience. Don't get it. Don't go after it. No. You've got to go out and try to win every freaking Sunday. You have to. Yep necessary that's how you build a winning culture and you just have to have the guy that keeps going out there and getting it keeps working harder than everybody else keeps showing up keeps believing keeps making the throws keeps making the plays keeps getting back up keeps getting back in the huddle that is what you need if you want to build a winning culture and that's what joe burrow will bring it doesn't matter for oh and six oh and seven oh and eight he will continue to say i will never adjust to losing losing will never be acceptable Mm -hmm. That was the best quote I heard from Joe Burrow because this is not, we are the Cincinnati Bengals. We already have losing designed into the DNA. It's stitched into the fabric of these uniforms. It's a part of it. It's, it's happened forever. Our kickers getting cramps, Vontez perfect, taking people's heads off, right? Yeah. Houston Oilers running all over us, all this stuff, right? It's just a part of being a Bengal. You're going to lose games. You have to have the guy that never accepts it, that never says it's okay, that never says we're building something because it's about this week. And that's why some people said, well, you should have just handed off. Never throw them throw 61 times. Lose the game 35-14, but don't ruin your rookie quarterback. Hey, you go ahead and be on the coaching staff and look Joe Burrow in the eye and tell him that. Okay? <laughs> Stop throwing. No. Nope. If Joe is out there to win the game, does not care about getting hit. Now, you can say, well, you got to be the big bad coach and take over. No, you just need to do things better so we do not have to throw 61 times. But let the kid go. He's a seasoned veteran. He needs to be playing like it, and he needs to keep propelling this team forward. I, I love Joe Burrow. I, I, he is more – he's exceeded my expectations, which if you watch this show before the season started, that should blow your top off, right? He has yep. exceeded my expectations. But the team has – fallen hilariously short in a lot of areas of what I thought they could maybe be, which was league average. So it'll be interesting to see they get a break in the schedule here with Eagles Jaguars, Matt. We are two and zero oh against the spread. Both of us. Yeah. Oh and two over under You're one and one over under what's the lines this week. What do we bet? Oh, uh, lines this week. Let's see. Versus the Eagles Bengals plus six and a half over under at 46.5. Oh, boy. Listen, Eagles minus six and a half. I think it's silly. Now, I usually put a line in my head, and if Vegas is way off, I need to recalculate the game. Yeah. But I just don't get it. It's a Bengals team that's got 10 days to prepare for the Eagles. It's an Eagles team that's 0-2. I get that they're going to be desperate and they're going to be fighting. Also, that could be it, yeah. They're injured. A lot of people are injured, but the Eagles especially. Their quarterback doesn't have much confidence. He looks like he's out of his rhythm. Looks like he's trying to do too much. And the Eagles are an NFC East team, and I think all those teams are just about league average at their yeah. best. Like, I'm just not that. I picked the Cowboys to be the one seed. I think I was wrong there. I just think all those teams, it's going to be another 9-7 and seven champion in that division. If it's going to be another 9-7 and seven champion, and I don't think the Eagles are the best team. I think the Eagles are an 8-8, eight 7-9 eight, team. That means they're beatable. So plus 6.5 to me, with 10 days to prepare, with Joe Burrow, I just think the kid's going to keep it close. Maybe, maybe it's another backdoor cover, but 6.5, Matt, is a lot of points to me. I'm going to take the Bengals plus 6.5. I had this as a blowout before the season, but after seeing these two teams play, I think it'll be a close one, and the Eagles might have that dog in them and might be a little more desperate and might want to go one and two more than some of the Bengals do. But plus six and a half, that's the bet for me. And I'll go over because I just think this defense is about to get ripped to shreds again by Carson Wentz, and Joe Burrow is going to have to keep up. 
And to me, that smells over, 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 over. So plus six and a half Cincinnati and over on the game. Yeah, I think, I mean, the way that the Eagles and Carson Wentz has looked, this they're looking at this game and going, we can't lose this game. This is our comeback. We cannot go 0-3. So I think it'll be a shootout. Um, I, 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 when I saw this line at negative six and a half, I expected it to move, getting closer to where we are now. I still think it might get, get, get down to six 5.5 by game start but I'm also going to take the Bengals plus points and the over probably going to be a shootout um watching our defense after last game they make one of those stops and it's a different game so hopefully I'm going to force you to be pot like what is the most positive spin you can put on the defensive performance from Thursday because I've got two you have two? Okay, you go first, and then I'm going to copy your homework and change it a little bit. Best running back duo in the league, and you had a short week to prepare, and you had two key injuries. So that's really three. But really, the injuries shouldn't matter. You shouldn't get gashed like that no matter how many injuries happen. But yeah. short week to prepare, best running back duo in the league. What if at the end of the season the Browns have dropped over 160 yards rushing on everybody because they ran the ball really well against the Ravens? Yeah. So if this is just a normal performance for the Browns and they're going to do this to everybody and the Bengals were hurt even more because it's a short week and the defense is actually better than what we saw. That's like my, <laughs> maybe if we get Gino back, it'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why is he supposed to be back? That's, I think uh, he's 50, 50 this week so far. Okay. That'll be great. I would love to have him back. But what, what's your spin? What's your good spin from the defense's performance? My good spin on the defense was going to be they looked better-ish at times in the first week. So uh, four days, like they, not enough time to prepare. Hopefully after 10 days, they look a little look a little better. We make some adjustments on defense after these first two weeks. And uh, if we can win the turnover differential against the Eagles – I mean, Eagles just got – I don't know what the, I don't know what it just was, but they looked terrible. So, if the Bengals can capitalize on some of that and then you just let Joe Burrow do his thing, just give him more opportunities than the Eagles' offense to score, and I think we can win. Yeah, I, I, so you're going to go Bengals plus six and a half then. Are you over or under? I am over. Wait, so we're both the same then. So you're doing this because you have a one-point lead on me. You're just trying to. <laughs> I'm not going to copy you every week. I would have wrote this down. This is what I was going to pick anyway. <laughs> Here's the, the thing that's been in my head this week that's really exciting for Bengals fans. And I think really a good sign for the season moving forward. Because the first two weeks, we get a really good feel of the team. You know, the third week will tell us the story. First two weeks is a feel. The third week tells us a story. Because now you have the biggest sample size you have. And then the fourth week is the true conclusion of you can really take a wide look at the league. That third week really tells the story. And to me, the number one thing we should watch for, Matt, is if Joe Burrow outperforms Carson Wentz. Because then he would be three for three of being the better quarterback. Mm -hmm. And then you look ahead at the schedule. And I want you – I want to hear your opinion on it. I want to go game by game. Because this is a great way to pick. If you ever go through an NFL season and just pick the team with the better quarterback, you can usually get fairly close. So we move through the schedule. Yeah. Now think about it. If Joe Burrow, play this way, if Joe Burrow is better than Carson Wentz on Sunday, so imagine he's above Carson Wentz in your mind. Against the Jaguars, who has the better quarterback? Bengals. Bengals. Joe Burrow or Gardner Minshew, you take Joe Burrow. Lamar Jackson? We'll give it to Lamar, right? Yeah. Yep. Philip Rivers? <laughs> I'll take he didn't Joe look Burrow. great. <laughs> I'll take Joe Burrow. Yeah. He's already better than Baker. Titans, Ryan Tannehill. What do you think about that one? I think that's going to be a little closer. Tannehill, Tannehill had some great plays. He's efficient. He's looked good so far this year. He's starting to really learn how to play quarterback. You can tell he didn't yeah. do it. And so it's, it's been impressive. We'll give it a push against the Titans. Yes, yep. Burrow against Big Ben. I mean, this will be in November. So Burrow might be better than Big Ben at this point. It'll at least be close. Burrow versus Haskins. What do you think? Burrow. 
right? Burrow, sure. Yeah. Daniel Jones. Burrow. Was he out for a little bit? So he'll probably be back. Yeah, he'll probably be back November 29th. Then it's Ryan Fitzpatrick or Tua. Tua having had less time starting than Burrow, I would go Joe, right? Yeah. I mean, I have a I have a special place in my heart for Ryan Fitzpatrick. I want him to continue playing for the next 10 years and win a Super Bowl. But I think Tua will be the starting quarterback for that game. So then it's Burrow versus Tua, which will be yeah. a nice fun matchup. I would take Burrow. Some would take I'll Tua. Take Burrow, yeah. But whatever, push. Then, it's then you have Burrow versus Andy Dalton. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I got to go with Dalton. There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way that Joe Burrow can. <laughs> I was about to be like Dak, and you were like, "It's him." <laughs> By that time, he'll have won the job, right? That—that yeah. that is, that's my hope for that game. I would love for Andy Dalton to start that game. We have a Dalton Burrow matchup. So in this one, by December thirteenth, if Burrow is better than Wentz, though, Matt. Yeah. Monday, by December thirteenth, I'm going to bet Burrow is better than Dak. I'm going to bet Burrow is better than Dak. Okay. Dak's going to have way better numbers, but people that know quarterback play are going to say, yeah, Burrow's better than Dak. Then by the next week, I think he'll be better than Big Ben. It really depends on Ben, not on Joe, right? I think yeah. that's up to Ben. And then you would take Deshaun, and then you would take Lamar. Mm -hmm. That's how the season ends. So by my count, we have one, two pushes. Wait, two, three, four. Four pushes, and then one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, seven or eight games where we have the better quarterback. Yep. And that to me is amazing news. I mean, for a rookie quarterback first year, it's amazing. That's yeah. amazing news, Bengals fans. If you, if I told you before the season, hey, in 10 games this year, which by the way, before the year, I went through the schedule, we did this, and I thought Burrow would be better in 10 games. And that's what it's looking like right now. He'll be better in 10 games. If you have the better quarterback in 10 of your games, you are just a couple of roster tweaks away from being a playoff team. That's step one, right? Just like in the NBA, step one, find a superstar. Yep. Step one, complete. Build around him. And build around him. And build around him. And I love Jonah Williams, that great block. You know, I'm excited. At least they're fun to watch. I mean, have you had fun in these first two weeks, Matt? Like, what has been your fun level? My fun level? Um, it, it, has, it has been fun. I mean, I like – they're, they're kind of we, – we thought with Joe Burrow coming in here, it was going to be a new day. We were going to have completely new Bengals go 16-0. and 0, And, they're, they're, you know, they're doing kind of like some throwback things where they're throwing some – some stupid Bengals luck, Bengals plays in there just to, you know, keep the fans interested. But <laughs> I would say fun, fun levels up there because it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm expecting that the, the only position, the only part of the Bengals that has drastically improved is, is quarterback, is Joe Burrow. So that is what I'm enjoying watching because that is something that now I can kind of fixate on. I can watch that and I can, I can see, okay, he is not struggling in this game. He, he is, and especially if Joe Burrow goes 16 games and he has these two-minute end-of-the-game comeback type of bring his entire team down the field – go into scoring position for a chance to win the game. And then we start losing it on like, uh, you know, onside kick or whatever. But if he does that, if he continues to do that and he doesn't choke under that pressure, he continues to be clutch. That's the most fun. Yeah. Is it, that's the most exciting part. We've had yeah. four opportunities for two minute drills. He's finished three of them, mm -hmm. right? Or at least gotten a field goal. And one was missed, obviously. And, and if you look, I, Patrick Mahomes started three of nine against the Chargers. Now, Mahomes just talented everybody in that fourth quarter. I mean, that was pretty incredible what he did against the Chargers. But think about those games. Mahomes was behind, so he had to drag the team back. Mm -hmm. Chargers controlled the game. So he threw a, threw a little more than Joe did. 
Joe controlled the game and then had to lead a comeback to try to tie it. They both would have tied the game to send it into overtime. Yep. They both uh, Joe would have won in overtime. I, I think that's, that's pretty much cinched because of the way that offense was moving. As a Bengals fan, that should be your biggest hope. As you look at the way the Chargers played the Chiefs, and you say, wait a minute, man. Like, Mahomes couldn't handle that defense. So was it really rookie struggles for Burrow out of the gate, or was it just this incredible defense that he's playing? What about this Eagles defense? Dwayne Haskins looked like a competent pro against them. What's Burrow yeah. going to It's going to happen this year, okay? It's going to come out of absolutely nowhere, and Burrow is going to throw – for an he's going to have an obscene day, right? Everybody's talking about this deep ball stat. That's a dam that's waiting to break open because they are this close. It's not like Andy. You know, poor AJ. AJ's not used to balls being in the right spot because you'll see he's running the route and then he'll like slow down like, okay, this is normally where I have to retreat. And <laughs> then I got to jump over the defender. And... and he gets ready to do that and he goes, oh, wait, I should actually just have kept running because it's actually a perfect ball and he gets pushed out of bounds. Once those things get ironed out, once Joe finds the targets, once they can run the ball a little bit, because it'll happen, and they come out of that cover two shell, and he's feeling it, and he's in rhythm, and he has a little bit of time, that deep ball dam is going to burst open. And yeah. as soon as he hits one or two of those shots, ball game. Ball game, people. Because the kid is so good at making decisions that if you can't take away one option, you have to now surrender that to chase the game. And he's hit these shots to get the corners and safeties to back up. He's got you by the balls, literally. I mean, there's nothing you can do. That's what Peyton Manning would do. You hit a few here, you hit a few here, you throw balance. They're on their back feet. They're behind, so they're chasing the game. They're sending blitzes, and you just obliterate them. And he's going to drop 42 or 45 points on somebody's head. He's going to throw four or five touchdowns. It's going to happen one time. And it's mm -hmm. going to be against a decent defense, and everybody's going to be like, oh, my gosh, that looked impressive. That looked impressive. And I'm just waiting. Maybe it's this Sunday. Hopefully it's this Sunday, 10 days. That'd be great. That'd be amazing. If we're one and two and he throws like four touchdowns, no picks, 348 yards, defense looks solid, Carson Wentz throws away two interceptions, and we got the Jaguars next week? I mean, Bengaldom's going to be pretty happy. So I, I'm thrilled. I'm happy. I, we're not nine and seven. We're not a playoff team. My prediction was wrong. It needed the two and zero start. Not going to happen. I think this can be a seven and nine football team. I think maybe an eight and eight. But watching how special this kid is is the number one attraction of the season, and I'm thrilled for it. Oh yeah, absolutely. You brought up the deep ball. Let me talk to you about the uh, the wide receivers for the Bengals with AJ Green not looking full. A.J. Green, um, Tyler Boyd looks good, but then you have John Ross being John Ross, and then you have Auden Tate, who is not starting, not playing, and unhappy. See, you know, this is what kind of ticks me off about Zach Taylor, right? Mm -hmm. It's about this winning culture, good culture, trusting each other, teammates, yeah, 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 like all this stuff. And then he does crap like bench Andy Dalton on his birthday. He does crap like Auden Tate dominating in camp. And you don't, you don't activate him. Like, he's no. a scratch? Like, what is that? that? You don't gain respect that way. He earned that time. So, I, I don't know if it, whether it was strategy or the last chance for John Ross, but Auden Tate should never, ever, ever, ever be on the bench while John Ross is on the field. Ever again. Neither should Mike Thomas. Neither should A.J. Green. Neither should Tyler Boyd. Um, and there might be two other guys that I'd rather have out there than John Ross. Because here's the thing about John. He looks lost. He looks lost. He looks like he's not in rhythm. He's not in time. He doesn't know when the ball's coming. He doesn't know whether he's open. He doesn't know. He just looks lost. And that's not good. T. Higgins, that's one I forgot. T. Mm -hmm. Higgins would definitely be out there above him. It's a good thing we didn't pick up that option because John Ross will not be an effective Cincinnati Bengal he might be a second stop, have one 800-yard year guy, but he's officially a bust. Um, he's officially done. He should be cooked. We should actually look to trade him and see if somebody just wants a guy who runs a 4-1-7. Because he's yeah. not going to work with Joe Burrow. It doesn't matter. You need to be on time. 
You need to be looking for the ball. You need to run your routes right to work with Joe Burrow. That's why Mike Thomas looks so good. Mike Thomas has half the talent John Ross has, but he does everything right, and his head's in the game. And that's why I'll be one of the more effective receivers moving forward. And Auden Tate is in the same boat. Big catch radius, smart runner. I, we, we saw all those pictures and all that, all that rave coming from training camp. I was like, wow, I cannot wait to see Auden Tate in these games catching some of these Joe Burrow toe-tapping touchdowns, and we're not getting that. What's crazy is Joe has – there's actually been two or three touchdowns left on the field by either Joe or the Bengals receivers. The Ross drop, the Uzama trip, the A.J. Green overthrow, the yep. Tyler Boyd drop in the end zone just recently. Those are all touchdowns, right? So that's two or three more that should be on the kid's stat line. Should be at six, uh, six total touchdowns, one pick through two games. So I, the receiving core is going to be fine and it will be fine for the rest of this kid's career. You know why? Because Tom Brady's receiving core was always fine. Peyton Manning's receiving core was always fine. You just got to draft talent and he'll make it work. We should never, ever, ever spend big money on a wide receiver again, unless we get Deandre Hopkins walking through that door or Randy Moss. That's, right? nice. That's not AJ green. So AJ green to me, if he wants to come back for $5 million a year at the end of his career for the next four or five years, sure. But anything more than $5 million, I'm out. You can go play somewhere else, AJ, because we don't – the kid really doesn't need you. And we need money on the offensive line. We need money on the defensive line. We need money in the linebackers. We need, we need money spent on corners. We can't spend money on wide receivers. And honestly, the more I think about the Joe Mixon deal, shouldn't have spent money on a running back either. But it is what it is. We got him on the cheap for five years. I'm, I think we'll be fine. I think he'll be fine. I think we'll be great. I, I think the receivers aren't to worry about because they'll have good numbers because it's Joe Burrow. Um, yeah. It sucks that A.J. Green's not elite because that would have been a game changer. That would have been a game I think, I think he, he's going to have an elite game. They are, there's going to be a Burrow to A.J. Green three-touchdown game. For sure. But he's not an elite wide receiver anymore. If he can be a top 50 wide receiver, I think that's still possible but he's not going to be one of the best five guys in the league. And that was what I was holding out hope for, for yeah. team to make the playoffs. Cause that's what Reggie Wayne did. Andrew Luck's uh, rookie year. He was one of the best wide receivers in the league at age 32. And AJ Green needed to do that. Maybe he will, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't look like he's out of time. It looks like he's just, it's just a little older. Just a yeah. step. That's all it takes in the NFL. Half a step and all of a sudden you're covered. Half a step, all of a sudden, you go from top 10 to top 50. And I think that's what happened to A.J. Green. It is what it is. I'm sure I'll have a great game. But I wanted him to be upper echelon top five guy, and he's just not. And that's okay. That's okay. He's 32. Yeah. Coming back and being scary and going back into the, all oh, top five, ranked your top five wide receiver type of – but he, he has not looked like that yet. No, and, and God, we'll make the playoffs if over the next 14 games, A.J. Green's a top five wide receiver. Because that means the ball starts working. And that we, I, we might have, in terms of points, by the end of the year, a top 15, top 10 offense. Just from, yeah. I think we'll chase a lot of games. We'll score a lot of points. It'll be fun. And it'll be exciting. Anything else, Matt? I, I think we're coming up on time on the 3 a.m. Coney. Well, I was going to say you asked me uh, what my most – fun part of watching the Bengals is and it, that kind of coincides with my least fun is not protecting Joe Burrow when we're out there we, we, when the fans are watching Joe Burrow and we're going wow this kid is the real deal and then you see the offensive line doing the longest yard just like letting people go past them and just three people hitting Joe Burrow at once it's like no protect him Protect him. I don't care what you have to do. Do not let this kid get hit every play. How about Fred Johnson tossing a lineman onto his ACL? Like it was – that was horrifying. Fred Johnson would have been cut if he would have hurt Joe Burrow on that play. What are you doing to yeah. drive the guy back to your quarterback? You should be pushing him away or pushing him up so that he can hit him clean. You don't want to roll a guy over on your quarterback. Why are, why are we teaching our offensive line fundamentals? I don't understand. Why do we have to – I just – Bobby Hart's making $7 million, guys. We're paying him $7 million, and he looks horrified. It, like, every, 
everyone knew that was a terrible deal. I think that when Bobby Hart, I think Bobby Hart false starts on 60% of the plays, but the refs can see how terrified he is. They give him the half second head start. He gets on <laughs> they go, you need it. You need the help. That You know, I'm not going to flag him on that. Because watch, go back and watch the game. Bobby Hart starts early more than any tackle I see in the league, and he never gets called for it. Because if he doesn't start that half step early, he gets annihilated by anybody that's a bubbly average on the end. I mean, yeah. annihilated. I've never seen a guy so many times – because you would think, right, I get that on some protections you shift out. You shift out and, and make a pocket. I get that. But you would think if you're not sure, if Bobby Hart's sitting there like, oh, crap, what protection are we in? Oh, I have no idea what protection we're in. Why don't we stay close to the other offensive lineman and fill the inside gap so that he's got to at least run around to at least give Joe a shot, because he'll see him coming. Instead of doing, oh, he just go, he goes into like a smoke screen, where he's just like, I'm just gonna kind of, I'm just gonna kind of meander on this way. It's like he's David Blaine pulling off a magic trick, and like, oh, <laughs> they have four offensive linemen now, run right through, like Bobby, just cover the interaction. Sure. Like, and he's like, and then he'll do this. He'll go, oh man, I was supposed to block. <laughs> Oh, how'd he get past me? I didn't even touch him. Bobby, like Bobby. And then I just, my theory on this is, is the coaching staff, Zach Taylor is addicted to practice grading, right? He's addicted to grades and on analytics. And that's the type of coach he is. And I love that stuff. But the practice grade is why Auden Tate was on the bench, because I bet he was poorly graded in practice. But if you sit there and think about it, practices aren't games. Talking about practice. And Bobby Hart, I guarantee you, if you go through and grade his game, as Pro Football Focus does, he has a lot of solid plays, solid run plays, solid pass plays. But the problem in the NFL is an F play isn't always just an F play. Sometimes an F play loses you the entire football game. And yep. that's exactly what Bobby Hart did on Thursday night. You cannot have two or three horrendous, oh, my God, even of even even my girlfriend who didn't know what an offensive line was two years ago is going, what the hell is that guy doing? Right? Yeah. You're doing that twice a game? You cannot have it. You can't have it. And you especially can't have it for $7 million. If we were paying the dude $350,000, i would be fine with it. But the man is making $7 million. $7 million. <laughs> All right, we gotta we gotta end on this before I go and do a thirty minute rant on Bobby Hart. <laughs> All right, yeah. negative note on the three M Coney, but you know what? Positive for the Bengals and for the Reds, right? Yeah. In the whole That's day, right. Coney, baby. That's right, three M Coney. <laughs>